physical training, self-defense training, firearms training, situational awareness, and the warrior mindset. Welcome to the Condition One Podcast. This is a podcast. This we're podcast. We're we're talking about. Welcome to the Condition One Podcast. This is a podcast where we'll be talking about being ready. We'll also be speaking to victim survivors of physical encounters, how they dealt with the aftermath physically, mentally, and spiritually. And welcome to the Condition One Podcast with me, your host, John Riddle. Uh, today, we're speaking with Ed Morales, who was is a retired FBI agent out of the Miami office and the author of the book, the FBI Miami Firefight, Five Minutes That Changed the Bureau. Uh, Ed, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. And believe me, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, I was very happy that when I reached out to you that you answered, because I know I I can only imagine you're very busy, and, uh, you know, I was happy to to be able to uh, reach out and touch base with you and have you on. Uh, The Miami Firefight... uh, April 11th, 1986, it, it hits me a little bit uh, because all my life growing up, I always wanted to get into law enforcement. Uh, I was in the Broward County Police Academy at that time uh, when, when this took place, and it was like it was almost at our back door. Uh, I, I actually, I almost remember it was like, like yesterday. Um, so I want to get into that a little bit uh, further down the road here. But being an FBI agent, what what sparked your interest to be in the FBI and not uh, a local Texas agency when you were growing up? Well, you know what, though, uh, John, that's a, that's a good question. But in, in reality, I, I wanted to be a police officer when I was a young kid. Mm-hmm. OK, and, and I always thought that was pretty cool. I don't know why, I, you know. Uh, my father was in the Army Air Corps in World War II, mm-hmm. and I had uncles. Uh, during, I, I grew up during the Vietnam era. I had uh, uncles and cousins that, that served in, in the uh, military uh, during the Vietnam era, you know. And I, I don't know, it was just maybe something genetic. I have no idea, but I wanted to be a cop. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, life gets in the way, you know, elementary school, <laughs> yeah. junior high, uh-huh. you know, all that stuff, you know. And then uh, in 1971, I got a draft notice. I'm thinking, oh, my God. You know, 71, it's a okay. a real deal. Yeah. Yeah, it's a real deal. So mm-hmm. uh, I said, well, I'll show Uncle Sam. I, you know, he's not going to draft me. I, I enlisted in the Marine Corps, and I showed them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, as it turned out, by the time I went through my training, it was uh, early 1972, and then by that time uh, – uh, Henry Kissinger and uh, President Nixon uh, had been in, in talks with the uh, North Vietnam, and they came to uh, some sort of an accord, and peace broke out. Mm-hmm. And my my unit was actually getting ready to deploy to Vietnam. Okay. And then uh, the president canceled the war and said, "Okay." <laughs> okay. So then I had uh, I had about three and a half years left in my in my enlistment. I'm thinking, "Okay, what the heck am I going to do?" You know. So, sure. So uh, one day uh, there was a, an announcement at the uh, at the uh, company uh, morning muster and uh, they said hey we need uh, volunteers to go to a, a, a security program and he, and the CEO he got a, got kind of a big laugh you know said but there's only two people that qualify in the whole company because uh, you got to have more than three years of, of uh, enlistment time left and you can't have a criminal record so <laughs> Everybody, everybody <laughs> chuckled at that, you know. So he said, and one of those two is, uh, you know, Private Morales, you know, and, and the other, the other guy was a corporal or something. You know? mm-hmm. So he said, see me after muster, you know. So unit broke up, and I went to see him, you know. And the next thing I know, I'm in Washington D.C. Uh, going through the Marine Security Guard Battalion program, you know. And you know, make make a long story short, I was assigned to uh, for a year in Bulgaria, and then from Bulgaria, I went to Madrid, Spain. Now in Madrid. Madrid has a, um, it, it's a, it's a European uh, country, mm-hmm. and they had an FBI agent assigned to the embassy. He was called the legal attaché. Okay. And um, as it turns out, we, we started becoming pretty good friends. And I was, I was in Madrid for about five years, 
Uh, I was there for uh, two and a half years uh, in, uh, with as a Marine, and in the balance, I was there as a civilian going to college at the uh, air base okay. in, in Madrid, mm -hmm. Torrejon Air Force Base. And, uh, you know, I, I, we socialized, and he, one day he pulled me aside. He goes, hey, Ed, uh, I understand you're close to graduating. I said, yes, sir. He said, hey, have you ever considered a, a job, a position with the FBI? And, and I'm looking at him like, wow, Jerry. I said, you know what? I never, ever thought about it because I always thought you had to be a lawyer or an accountant. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm an FBI. And he chuckled. He said, yeah, you know, that, that's a misconception that a lot of people have. Huh. He said, those are two of, the, two of the big programs. He said, we, we recruit a lot of lawyers and we, we recruit a lot of attorneys. I mean, uh, accounts. Uh, but he said, hey, we also recruit engineers, uh, scientists, you know, metallurgy people, mm -hmm. uh, linguists. And then he said there's also a, a, a catch-all category called diversified. He said we hire former military and, and former or current police officers. I said, wow, that's great. He said you qualify in two areas. You're a, a diversified military, mm -hmm. and you're also uh, eligible for the linguist program because... He said, you speak Spanish, right? I said, yeah, on a scale of one to five. Since I was living in Madrid, I spoke yeah. at, at about a four. Okay. So I said, that's great. He said, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I think you're a good candidate. I'm going to call or I'm going to write my headquarters in Washington and get you an application. <clears throat> and a few weeks later, he, you know, he locates me. He hands me an application. He said, hey, make 10 copies of this application. So if, in case you screw up a copy, you don't have to wait around to, you know, yeah, request yeah, another yeah. one. So sure. he said, hey, rough draft the questions, and then after you, you know, you rough draft them, let it sit, review it, and then rough draft, draft them again and, and so mm -hmm. on until you get it right. Okay. So he said, when you finish it, give it to me, and I'll send it to Washington. I said, sure, that's great. And that's what happened. I mean, that's how he basically recruited me in 1978, early 79. Okay. So uh, in 79, I, I uh, <clears throat> transferred back to... Uh, Washington, and uh, I called headquarters, FBI headquarters, and I, I said, hey, my name is, uh, you know, Joe Schmo, Ed Morellas, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's the status of my application? And they, and they said, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> they said, we have no record of you, and I'm thinking, wow. oh, crap, you know? Yeah. So I said, hey, and then they asked me, where are, where are you living right now? And I said, I'm living in Alexandria, Virginia. I said, he, I said okay. Well, you need to apply through the Alexandria office. I said, okay, thank you. So I contacted the Alexandria office, told them what happened. They said, hey, do you have a copy of your application? I said, yep. They said, well, mail it in. We'll review it, and then we'll contact you. And then that took about nine months. You know, and, and by September of 70, uh, 79, I was at the FBI Academy. Okay. Excellent. Wow. What a process. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. I tell you what, if I hadn't been, you know, if I hadn't caught the eye of the FBI agent in Madrid, I probably never would have considered it. Yeah. Because again, just I had didn't know, right? right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, are you teaching at the academy now? No, oh, no. I've been retired for twenty years now, John. Okay. You know, right. and uh, I mean, I, all, any teaching I do, I do to uh, the police conferences or uh, different police departments that that request my my uh, my presence. You know. Okay. Or like, like one time I went to Houston, uh, the Houston FBI office had a, um, like a citizens, um, I, I don't know what you call it, you know, like citizens on patrol. Like in okay. The, yeah. <laughs> I know like what you mean. Police yeah. Academy. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> you know, one of those groups, you know, it, it's just a, a, a mutual group, you know, some mm -hmm. civilians and, and law enforcement. So I, I, I do some of those, but you know, with the COVID, I mean, 20, 2020 was a disastrous year. I had sure. eight or ten conferences scheduled for 2020. Every one of them was canceled. Canceled, yeah. You know, so uh, I'm just trying to get back into the back into the swing of things. But you know, you know how things are. You know, I'm, I'm, you're, you're a trainer. You know, things sure. things can be slow to develop. You know, sure, so, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Quantico, when you went through versus Quantico today, can you tell me anything about? how things have changed over the years? <laughs> Woo. Wow. It's like comparing uh, a, 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 a Western town in 1860 <laughs> to 
a Western town in 1960. You know, okay. I mean that mm -hmm. that's the that's how huge of a difference it, it is. You know, I mean I I saw it. Uh -huh. You know, before I retired, I, I went back to the academy in my last uh, three years, mm -hmm. and it is just incredible how much how much that in my in my in the span of my career it changed. You know, tremendously. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it, we we just like. Law enforcement training was jumped ahead light years, in, in my opinion, mm -hmm. in some areas. In other areas, you know, it's not not so progressive. You know, like um, legal. Mm -hmm. We uh, the FBI has uh, has a heavy dose of legal training. You know, I think forty percent of the training at the academy is it used to be legal. Now I think it's down to like thirty with every with all the other stuff. You know, counterterrorism. You know, all this other stuff. You know. Um, that's being taught now, it's probably been reduced by about 10%, you know, but um, but aside from the legal, everything else changed, you know, firearms training changed, we, uh, they started developing a, a real deal, um, Hogan's Alley, if you're, you're a trainer, you right. know what Hogan's mm -hmm. Alley is, yes. but for the benefit of the audience, it's a mock city, right. you know, where, where for law enforcement and or military people can train, you know, it's like, hey, you're in a real urban environment and you got houses and doors and driveways mm -hmm. and, you know, that type of stuff. So they, uh, they developed that. Um, they, uh, the FBI never had EVOC training, emergency okay. vehicle operator training, we, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, police and state police, you know, those are the ones that do the, the high speed chases, but the FBI never had it, even though <laughs> we, we sometimes get involved in sure. in car chases, you mm -hmm. know. So, so they, they they developed a new course there, and uh, God, what else? When when I went in, there was no such thing as hostage rescue, you know, and uh, they okay. took up like wow, man. When they took up residents of Quantico, uh, I mean, they took took over like twenty five percent of the uh, of the area. I mean, okay. it, it seemed like twenty five percent is probably mm -hmm. way less than that, but maybe ten or fifteen percent. Mm -hmm. When they showed up, man, they left a big footprint, you know, because they they were just starting to develop their sure. their uh, their structures and their ranges and so on. You know, okay. So, so uh, God, what else? I mean, there's probably so much more that I forget, you know, so, uh, but those are the big points. The firearms training, you, uh, you talked about it in the book. Uh, how, when you were in the academy, how much emphasis was put on firearms training? Well, you know what, though, that, that's one thing where I am, I am amazed. I mean, I'm amazed, but I'm not amazed because, you know what, firearms training, as I'm, I'm sure you know very well, John, uh, budgets run sure. the world mm -hmm. you know budgets run departments mm -hmm. okay and budgets run training units okay oh, yeah. and we i was so lucky in that the the uh, fbi is a government agency u.s federal government agency mm -hmm. and we had a big budget man so i mean we were i i asked one time do you know how many rounds uh, are fired by new agents training in one month one million rounds a month are, are used oh my training. god you know, that's that's uh, for about five or six classes. Mm -hmm. There, there used to be before COVID. There used to be a cycle of five or six classes always on on the campus, cycling through, mm -hmm. cycling through. But after COVID, I mean, they didn't even have a class here for months. You know, so okay. So uh, we used to fire like mil I mean, million rounds a month. You know, can you imagine that? I My mean, God, the department wouldn't no. give their you know. IT Abs for absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, in that respect, you know, we we. Uh, Regulations wise, we we need to qualify four times a year. Every three months, we have to qualify okay. with a firearm and and a long weapon. You okay. Know? And if you don't qualify, if you don't pass qualification, you're put on on um, on uh, double secret probation. You know, kind of like Animal House. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not quite not quite so secret. They put uh -huh. you. They put. They kind of give you a notice, mm -hmm. and you're given uh, a week or two. To, pre to prepare for a second attempt. Okay. If you don't pass your second attempt, they will take your weapon from you. Okay. Okay. So that's a that's a very bad thing because then you're put on administrative duties. Okay. And then if you don't, uh, you know, I've never heard of anyone being fired, mm -hmm. but that is the pro the beginning process to being dismissed if you can't pass uh, firearms training. Gotcha. So it's very serious, you know. Sure. sure. So my, my whole point is, we fired, we qualified four times a year, and I I've talked to departments way back then, they qualified once a year or maybe mm. twice a year. And I'm thinking, man, that is not enough. No, you it's know, not. Because, I mean, 
even four times a year is not enough, really. Mm-hmm. We, 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 should, we should maybe not qualify, but uh, practice, official practice once a month. Yes. At least. Agreed. Okay. But uh, now, as far as the training goes, and, and I'm looking at it with hindsight, and I don't mean this with any disrespect to any department, you know. Mm-hmm. Every department has to, has to have liability protection, I guess you'd call it has to be able to justify, hey, why did we give John and Ed a handgun? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> sure. Okay, they need to be able to demonstrate, hey, John and Ed, here are their past scores. They mm-hmm. qualified, they, you know, with a, a, a percentage of 85%, you know, out of a, out of a 100% course. Mm-hmm. I mean, 100% qualifying course. And that way they can demonstrate, if, if we're involved in, a, in an incident, hey, these guys are properly trained, you know, we're training this weapon, these these rounds, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's all great and, and fantastic. Okay. And I'm all for, because I became a firearms instructor, I'm all for basic the basic fundamentals Absolutely. of firearms training. Mm-hmm. If you don't have the basic fundamentals, you how, how do you expect someone to really, you know, build on something? Absolutely. Okay, if you build on bad habits, you're going to, you're going to, you know, train bad habits. Mm-hmm. So our department, our, the Bureau back in the late 70s, early 80s, was so much stru- structured. We practiced a lot, but we, we shot in straight lines. You know what I mean? We, yes. we shot in, in straight lines. Mm-hmm. So, you know, mm-hmm. we shot at the, at, well, we used to shoot at the 50, the 25, 15, and then 7. Okay. We always shot in straight lines. There was never any, any movement. movement. There was never any stress, you know, I mm-hmm. mean, other than the stress you put on yourself, you know. Mm-hmm. There were no moving targets. There were no, you know, running and gunning and like, like, uh, like we do training nowadays, okay. Right. There was no shooting from cars, no shooting at targets in cars, you know. So it was all, it was all basic firearms training. You know? There was no real combat training. Right. But then I saw after the Miami shootout, you know, I saw the, the Bureau and a lot of other departments went, uh, decided to start enhancing their, their what they call combat training. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we, we went from shooting in lines, but I think they cut it. I don't know. I mean, I'm just guessing off the top of my head. They cut it back by a 25 or maybe even 30 percent. Okay, they reduced the inline shooting down to maybe 70, 60 percent. And the balance of that was all combat shooting, mm-hmm. shooting at moving targets, shooting and moving, moving or, and shooting, mm-hmm. shooting at multiple targets, right. shooting from inside a vehicle, shooting from, uh, you know, into a vehicle, you know, and all, all different kinds, you know, shooting under stress, you know, and shooting, simulating being wounded in the right hand, you know, shooting with your off hand, sure. you know, that type of stuff, shooting, shooting long weapons from inside a vehicle, you know, that type of stuff, because a lot of people, you know, really, I mean, I experienced that myself. I, sure. was trying to move, I was trying to manipulate the shotgun sure. yeah. inside the vehicle, and I couldn't. It was too long. Sure. You know? Yeah, I absolutely. get it to, to, to swing out, you know. So that's the only reason I never fired my shotgun mm-hmm. from inside the car. I was actually, if I had brought it up, I probably would have fired. Yeah. But I, I, as luck would have it, I couldn't because it was too too tight. But even even uh, when, when, they, when you talk about it in the book, and you're talking now about, you know, strong side sh- single hand shooting, support side single hand shooting. When you had to manipulate that shotgun, put it between your legs, yeah, and rack it. I mean, yep. who does that today? <laughs> I well, mean, who 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 I, trains I, that today? I mean, I, I, and, I, I've been I've been asked, did you train for that? And I'm thinking, nope, never no. trained. But you know what though. You have to have every law enforcement officer or military military uh, trooper, man or woman, has to have a base to build on. That's what I'm, sure. I'm telling you. Mm-hmm. You have to have a, a base, a strong base. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. The basic fundamentals of firearms. You have to know how to how to manipulate a weapon, whether it's a revolver, mm-hmm. a semi-automatic, a long weapon, uh, whether you rack it or, or change magazines, whatever. Mm-hmm. You got to have a base, and you you need to have very training, you know. Uh, how many people do you know when they fire a shotgun? Fire, fire a shotgun we, on offside on their offhand. Very little. We never. <laughs> I never fired a shotgun offhanded. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or an MP5 offhanded. Yeah. You know? Or an M6. Nothing. You know. Mm-hmm. It's always strong hand, strong. And what happens when your strong hand goes out? Boom. 
-hmm. you're gonna have to learn real quick you know so absolutely you know there's an interesting little sidebar here <laughs> i thought about it and i don't know if you have much time but it's mm -hmm. it it kind of it kind of rang a bell when somebody asked me the same question a few few weeks or months back. When I went through uh, my re uh, recruiting process, I went to the Alexandria FBI office, and I had the <laughs> the luck or misfortune to to be uh, to, to be uh, processed by a, a former Marine. He was a Marine Corps captain, Vietnam mm -hmm. guy, you know. They called this guy Yogi because he was short. <laughs> he looked <laughs> like a bear, you know. <laughs> he was built like a like a fire plug, you know. Uh -huh. Yogi was a Marine Corps captain, Vietnam era and stuff, you know. So he had me in there, you know. We we, we had to go at the time through a, what's what's called a um, a um, a trigger test, and you you had to hold the weapon. You had to hold a revolver up like this, aiming a level. Mm -hmm. And when they, you got the command, you had to squeeze the trigger as many times as you could in 30 seconds, you know, and that was a, supposed to supposedly reflected as um, some, uh, some level of strength in your arm. Yeah. Okay. If you could, if you couldn't do it 40 times in 30 seconds then you were, you know, thought to be lacking and you were told, Hey, listen, you need to strengthen your hand muscles or what? I don't even know what, what they would have told you. Sure. Same thing with your left hand. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many times can you pull the trigger? So the other, the second half of that test was he, he had a shotgun there. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, this is the second part of the test. We, you need to bring the shotgun up to your shoulder like you're going to fire it, you know, two hands. And then when I say go, drop, drop the support hand and hold the shotgun up with one hand like this. Okay. And hold it for 30 seconds and hold it steady. You know, I want to see whether you can hold it steady. And you know what? I thought about that. And maybe somewhere in the back of my, the recesses, recesses of my mind, mm -hmm. That stuck in my mind someplace, you know, holding a shotgun up, one-handed like that, mm -hmm. you know, aiming and firing. Because I remember, <laughs> I remember thinking this not, you know, as I'm doing this test, I'm thinking, who in the hell would ever shoot a shotgun with one hand, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Lo and behold, you know, like <laughs> seven years yeah, later. You are. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there I am, you know. Yeah. And somebody, somebody asked me a similar question, and it clicked something. In the old cobwebs, you know, and it's, I thought about it. I thought about Yogi, you know, and, yeah. and uh, I'm thinking, wow, you know, maybe maybe there was a maybe there was a very loose connection there, you know, that kind of sure. you know yeah. brought it home. I, who yeah. knows? But I never practiced right. Never practiced racking. Yeah. You know, again, that just came from, um, you know, just it just like a instinct. Instinct, it, you know. And the, the, I go again. I go back. You know, you need to have. You know, someone once told me that training. Practice and training are, in reality, uh, problem-solving events. Okay, you're given Agreed. you're given a task. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's direct. Shoot, you know, put put 50 rounds in that target. Mm -hmm. Okay, or you're given a test. You know, hey, listen, move from here from point A to point B mm -hmm. and put six rounds in this target, and then move from point B to point C and put six rounds in that target. You know, mm -hmm. it, you know, however many times you need to shoot to put six rounds on the target is up to you. You know, so you can shoot 12 times at one target, and if you sure. miss, it's on you, you know, but yeah. you got to put 12, 12 hits, I mean, six hits on the target. Okay. So training is problem solving, okay? Mm -hmm. And when I, when I'm, I'm thinking back to the incident, you know, it was, it was problem solving. It's like, hey, how do I manipulate this shotgun with one hand? Mm -hmm. how, you know, I, I can fire it at least one time, but how am I going to rack it? You know, and then as I'm sitting there, it just kind of came to me, it just poof. It just say, hey, hey, let it slide through your hand, pinch it with your thighs, rack it, grab the pistol grip again, come up, and again, you know, using uh, ha having a support for the shotgun. I was sitting at the bump at the back of the car, and I said, hey, there's a lip on this on this front, on this bumper. I said I can put the shotgun on that lip, and steady the weapon. You know, I've got it up here in my shoulder. I can put the lip, the, the forehand on, on the lip, and it'll steady it like my like my left hand. Yeah. And that's the way, you know, it just came to me. I mean, just, you're always looking for options. You're always looking for, for something. I think it's called survival instinct. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I believe so. Because not only did you do that, uh, but you did that under such extreme circumstances and pressure. Yeah. Um, and you know, I don't work well under the pressure. You know? No? <laughs> you're not going to sell me on that. Sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, doing it under such extreme pressure that you had uh, and, and just something clicking to make you do that, I think it does fall back to knowing the operation of the weapon just in your, right. like you said, in the fundamentals. I know right. the slide goes up and down. Okay, I'm not doing it in the normal way we do it, but it still goes up and down. Now right. I just have to, I have to manufacture a different way of doing it yeah. because of the exactly. circumstances, exactly. Right? Exactly. right? And then you had the wherewithal under that pressure and what was your distance? You know, this is another interesting question. My perception, because you know, I was I was starting by, when I was back at the at the at the back of the Gordon McNeil's car. I was I had by that time it was like three minutes mm -hmm. after I've been shot, I've been wounded. I was starting to lose a great deal of blood by then because, and I was you know kind of like a you know check oil light was coming. Sure. Out. Yeah. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. I was starting to, to pass out. My, my my vision was starting to to black Narrow. out like mm -hmm. like that. So my head was falling on my chin, like, oh man, I was like, I need to stay awake. So it was about three minutes into the into the shootout, you know, and and it, you know I, I was starting to get a little bit desperate, I guess you'd call it, you know, mm -hmm. to, to try to figure out, you know, what what to do and how to do it, you know. So it was, um, I mean, again, it was just staying focused on target, on task, you know. Mm -hmm. So. So that's, and a lot of that is probably the Marine coming out of you. A lot of it was that, you know, but I mean, I, I, I can't minimize the FBI training either. You right. Know? I mean, I mean, God, you know, I must have fired thousands of rounds, you know, mm -hmm. at Quantico. I mm -hmm. mean, handgun and shotgun and, and rifles. I mean, mm -hmm. because back then we used the old 308s, you know, back in okay. the uh, late, uh, late 70s, early 80s. Okay. There was, there was no 223s, you know, we, we all, we used all the 308s, you know, so. Gotcha. Okay. So it was a lot, 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 of, lot of practice there. All right. So you wind up at the Miami office. Uh, was it background investigations you did there you started out at? No, I or started out with background investigations at Washington. In D.C.? Office. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you know what, though? It was uh, a... <laughs> I, I like the way they think sometimes. You know, we were assigned to, in Washington, we were assigned to the bank robbery squad. You know, all new agents mm -hmm. were like, holy mm -hmm. shit, man, I'm on a bank robbery squad. Yeah. But what you, what you didn't see was a fine print. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, you know, the uh, the Rappahannock School of Law and small engine repair. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't see the small engine repair yeah. at yeah. the bottom <laughs> of the School of Law. And it was the same thing with the bank robbery squad. It says bank robbery squad and applicants. Okay. Wow. So all the all the new guys came in thinking we're on the bank robbery squad, mm -hmm. but you know, it's kind of like the old uh, Bugs Bunny cartoons, like Shh, get back in line. Yeah. You're working the applicants while the old guys, the senior guys, work the work bank, the bank robbers. Okay. So we were on a bank robbery squad, but we were working the applicant side. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> you know, all right. So, all right. And you know, so we did respond to bank robbers in, in Washington, but not not as many as Miami. Okay. You know. So when you did hit Miami, the Miami office, uh, you were finally assigned to the to the bank robbery squad. Yeah, that, uh, that was a straight bank robbery squad, bank robbery fugitives. Okay, I mean, it was like, there's no 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 sleight of hand. <laughs> sure, sure. Now, back back then, in in 86, were, were bank robberies prevalent? Were they, were they hitting pretty hard in you Miami? Know, a lot of people ask me that, you know, and the, the, the thing is, you have to, you're, you're from, the, you're from down there. Mm -hmm. We covered everything from Key West, to uh, Fort Pierce. Okay, that's a, yeah, that's a big. That's territory. huge. And all the way west to uh, Naples. Okay. So yes, there was a bank robbery every single day in, in our division. Okay. Okay. All right. You know, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, mm -hmm. South Miami. You know, uh, Hialeah. You, you name it. There was always a bank robbery. And on top of that, uh, when I say bank robberies. We also handled armored truck robberies. That's okay. still a federal violation. So if it's armored mm -hmm. truck or bank, you know, it doesn't matter. We, we responded. You know. So, yeah. yeah, you know what? Uh, there was at least a bank robbery a day down there. Wow. Or an armored truck robbery a day. However, it was not like California. I mean, out in L.A. back in the 80s and er, mm -hmm. uh, late 80s, early 90s, man, they had 10, 15, 20 robberies bank robberies in, in a day in, in, in L.A. That's crazy. That's, that's huge. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge. Wow. Yeah. Mm. 
So being on the bank robbery squad and things start to percolate a little bit, uh, what led you down the road to, to these two guys, to Platt and Maddox? Uh, well, what what uh, tipped it, you it, off to them? Well, you know what, though? If, if you read the book, the mm -hmm. very first thing that, uh, that triggered us, because right, right before the first incident, it was, uh, it was this, the steak and ale restaurant uh, mm -hmm. robbery. Mm -hmm. Okay. Up until that time, that they were, they were either non-existent or they were low-key, or I'm not sure whether they started on that day. I, I, I don't think they did. I think they were, they were just kind of practicing. Mm -hmm. But that steak and ale robbery, um, I think it was October 9th, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. um, it was unusual, e even by Miami standards, you know, and, and you're, you're here from mm -hmm. the South, you know, but you know, the South, that area, it, it, it takes a lot to impress you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but even by Miami standards, that was like different. Okay. Two guys jump out of the bushes. They, they attack a guard, right. uh, an armored truck guard, you know, they hit him on the head, you know, they walk him up to the truck and, you know, they, 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 he, they order him, tell your partner to open the door. And, of course, their instructions are don't open it, the door for anybody. Or anything sure. Or mm -hmm. So the, the truck driver drives away. He leaves the guard, you know, standing in the parking lot with a gun in his ear. <laughs> so it's like, oh, shit, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so the first thing that was a tip off was one of the two had a long weapon, and it was a two two three caliber. He fires 14 or 15 rounds into the back of the armored truck. Now, they call these things armored trucks for a reason, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a two, two, three round hitting the back of this car. It's just kind of like, you know, bouncing but, off, shattering, or uh -huh. whatever they did, you know. So that was one. And then the second thing is when they, they made their escape, they speed out of the, the steak and ale parking lot, and they threw out not one, but two white smoke grenades out of the back of the car. It's like, what? <laughs> I said, what the hell is this? It's like, it's just hacksaw ridge, you know. You drop, right. you drop the yeah. smoke for the uh -huh. for the helos to come down or something, you know. It's like, and they they threw out two smoke grenades, I guess, to cover their escape. You know, it's like, dude, I mean, you guys are speeding down the road at 40, 50 miles an hour. Why would you even bother with the smoke? You know, so, sure. So it's like just bizarro. I mean, that was just the bizarro beginning to, to these two guys. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, program. You know, so. Wow. So that right there told us it was just different, odd, you know. Okay. So I know you guys on the squad, you broke up into two-man groups and vehicles and did kind of like a rolling surveillance of... Right. We did that on, on the morning of April 11th. Correct? Right. So you were out and uh, just pretty much waiting, uh, seeing, hoping something pops. Well, you know what, though? That's a good question. It has an interesting answer, kind of a long answer. But okay. on April 10, Gordon McNeil, supervisor, mm -hmm. was at firearms training with Ben Grogan, the case agent for, for the, this whole mess. For the robberies. Oh. Okay, so uh, they were talking, and Gordon McNeil pulls Ben aside. And, and I, I know this conversation by heart because Gordon told us what happened. Gordon pulls Ben Grogan aside and says, hey, Ben. Uh, I think we should start. We should run a surveillance tomorrow on these guys. And Ben looks at Gordon and says, "What? What? what, what? He said, "Do you know something I don't?" He said, "No." He said, "No, I don't." He said, "But let me give you some information. Let, let me let me tell you what 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 I have. He said, I have a hunch, and that's the word he used. Mm -hmm. Hunch." Mm -hmm. He said, "Number one, it's been three weeks since these two yahoos hit a bank, okay. and and." The, the next day, Friday, would have been three weeks of the day. He said, three weeks. Number two, the last time they hit, they only got around $8,000. Normally, they got forty or 50000 mm -hmm. And then number three, he said, tomorrow's Friday. And they hit, most of their robberies are on Fridays. Not all of them, but most of them were on Fridays. I mean, I don't know whether they thought that's payday or whether that, that sure, payday yeah. thing still stands, you know. But mm. in our time, a Friday was payday. Payday, you know? right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Sure. So he said, "Hey, it's been three weeks. They only got eight thousand, and tomorrow's Friday, payday Friday." You know. So he said, "I think you know these guys are due." 
but it's just a hunch. What do you think is a heck? Yeah, you know, I'll sure. take all the help I can get. So, mm-hmm. he, I was in the squad area when when Ben Grogan called the uh, secretary and spoke to the bank robbery coordinator, uh, Steve Warner, and said, "Hey, Stevie, you know, see if you can uh, round up a bunch of guys to run a surveillance tomorrow, you know, in, in the southwest area." And and Steve asked him the same question. Hey, what's up? He said, "Nah, nothing. You know, we just want to run a surveillance and you know, see if we get lucky." And that was it. So, you know, Steve hangs up the phone and says, "Hey." Anybody that can help on the surveillance tomorrow morning, be here at seven. You know, I said, what's going on? You know, hey, what's what's up? You know, said, nah, I don't know. <laughs> Gordon sure. wants to run the surveillance, so just be here if you can be there. You know, yeah. so mm-hmm. and that was it. You know, okay. that, that that's the way it started on a hunch. Wow, so, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 Uh, can can you take us down that road? Can you take us down that road from the time uh, people your agents showed up that morning to okay. uh, to assist? We, uh, you know. Guys showed up at the office at different times, you know, depending on where they lived, you know. But I showed up at 7, you know, got my gear. Uh, my my biggest problem all morning was trying to find a par- somebody to partner up with because some guys were already partnered up. Mm-hmm. And uh, other guys couldn't go because they either had a court uh, they had a court uh, meeting, yeah. I mean, a court date, sure. or they, they were on leave, you know. So it mm-hmm. was like, it's kind of like catch as catch can. So I ended up with John Hanlon, you know, and... Uh, so just just by luck of the draw, and it's like, hey, John didn't have a partner. I didn't have a partner. So, I mean, normally I, I wouldn't team up with John. I mean, he's mm-hmm. I mean, not not that I don't like John. I love mm-hmm. John, you know. But I mean, John worked with Ben a lot because there were two two of the senior agents, you know. Right. Or uh, uh, John worked with Bobby Ross, and, but you know that day it was just him and me. You know, so we ended up going in his car. We get down to the uh, uh, Home Depot down there in, in uh, Southwest uh, US One. Mm-hmm. And we got there at about, I think it was like 9 o'clock, 8.45, 9 o'clock thereabouts. And we met there. We staged. We got the briefing. uh, Got the briefing from Gordon McNeil, uh, Ben Grogan. Got all the information that was available. You know, um, if you recall from the book, we had a a verified stolen car. Mm -hmm. uh, The stolen Monte Carlo, the black one. uh, Florida tag NTJ891. We had that. We had the composites from the uh, Metro Dade uh, Police Department, and we had a white pickup truck, and we also had a, another vehicle. It was a gray Le Mans or something that was missing. Some some missing persons report or something mm-hmm. came up that might be you know that that car might might be involved. And after we got the briefing, um, they made uh, assignments, and it was just random. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, we have four locations. And all four of those locations had had a bank robbery or an armored truck robbery at that spot before. Okay. So we figured, hey, you know what? Uh, mm-hmm. Let's go back to the areas because, you know, there's only so many banks to go around, you know, even in Florida, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> but uh, so we divvied up the squad. We have 14 agents. Uh, I was assigned to the northernmost location, 128th Street. Uh, it was uh, John Hanlon, myself, and uh, Steve Warner. And then the, the rest of the assignments were made to uh, 136th Street, 148th Street, and then 183rd, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Now, the Homestead uh, guys, the Homestead agents, uh, took 183rd because they, they were familiar with that area. Right. You know, so mm-hmm. so that was it. I mean, it's like, hey, the, the idea was, hey, listen, stand around, look around, see if you spot anything, look for the, for the black Monte Carlo, a white pickup truck. And... If anything happens, notify the rest of the squad and wait. Do not attempt to do anything while the while the robbers are in the bank. You right. Know, I mean that's that's pretty standard operating procedures, you know. So, and that was it. And you know what? So, somebody, I just had a I just had a podcast last week. Somebody asked me about, hey, what what were you, what were your thoughts? Mm-hmm. And I got to be honest with you, John. You, you know what complacency is, right? Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, I wasn't complacent. Mm-hmm. But I was complacent. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. I mean, complacency is like, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. You know, I always do it this way. Right. You know, I mm-hmm. always do it this way. Anyway. Or, hey, don't worry about it. Nothing ever happens here. Right. Nothing ever. You know, How many times have we heard that in, okay. in this business, you know, right? Nothing ever happens here. You know, hey, you know what? I always do it this way. Let's do it this way. You know, and, and you know, there's all forms of complacency. But I'm just throwing sure. those two mm-hmm. big examples out. You know, people can understand them. And... I, I was asked recently, and I've been asked many times before, what were your thoughts? And, you know, honestly, I was there as a team player. 
Okay, because my opinion was, are you, are you kidding me? Are they, do you think these two guys are stupid? Do you think they're going to show up in a stolen car? Because that car had been spotted three weeks before. Sure. Okay, and that the when they when they hijacked the the car owner in the Everglades uh, the previous uh, six weeks, that car and and the incident was in in the news mm -hmm. in the paper. Yeah, I'm thinking these guys would be morons to show up in the stolen car with the same tag. So I, I said to myself, you know what? We're probably going to waste four or five or six hours out here. But you know what? I'm out here with the team. I'm out here with the squad. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be a donkey. You know, and, yeah. and not show up, you know, uh -huh. because we weren't ordered. We were just told, hey, listen, if you have the time, you know, be a team player and show up and, and support the the case, yep. you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought, hey, you know, I'm going to sit here, waste four or five hours, you know, and nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And like five minutes later, <laughs> yeah. man, was I surprised. The radio announcement comes on, you know, comes on the uh, the air and says, attention all units. We're behind a black vehicle, two-door, Florida mm -hmm. tag, NTJ 891. And I, I tell you what, my mouth would probably hit the, the, the floor of the car if it fell open like that because I'm thinking, holy shit, these guys are actually here in the stolen car. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. You know, and then the, my next thought was, hey, are these guys that bold or are they that stupid? Mm -hmm. You know, and then after a while, I said, you know what, maybe they're that bold. Yeah. You know. Sure. And as it turns out, they were that bold. They were like, hey, in your face, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I have uh, in, in the book um, an excerpt from the introduction where you were just talking about it that uh, you, you wrote that I could hear Ben's tent, the tension in Ben's voice. Uh, we're behind a black Monte Carlo, Florida tag, uh, NTJ 891. Ben gave his command over the radio, felony car, it's a felony car stop, let's do it. And if you're in law enforcement, you know what a felony car stop is. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and the things that caught me that I highlighted in here was we we're off of US-1 in South Miami, which was still, one, flooded with morning rush hour traffic. Yep. Okay. Uh, a school was just a few blocks uh from our location to the east yeah. and then a wall stood between us and the shopping center so when yeah. i'm reading this i'm thinking okay as typical law enforcement people we have to watch out for people in rush hour traffic there's a school in case rounds are fired you know where are these rounds going and then what's our backstop there's a wall exactly. and the shopping center you know exactly right yeah so uh it, it was interesting to me, and then uh, another part I highlighted was April 11th, 1986, uh, drawn bright and sunny in Miami, Florida. By sunset, however, two FBI agents and two bank robbers were dead, and five FBI agents were wounded in the Miami shootout, uh, which was called the bloodiest day in FBI history. The incident prompted law enforcement agencies across the country to re-examine firearms and protective equipment they issued to their officers, as well as tactics they used to pursue and apprehend suspects. Lessons learned from this case continue to be studied in law enforcement circles today. I believe that. Uh, it was brought up to, to us in some in-service training. Uh, some of the schools that I had gone to in my career, many schools, uh, this was discussed in our tactical training. Mm -hmm. um, what type of tactical training did you guys have? And did you have any type of training in, in the in-service type training within, the, within your field office? You know what? It, it's an excellent question because a month before the incident, everybody was so uh, concerned about these guys. These guys were, I mean, they shot up a a lot of, you know, area. Mm -hmm. uh, the Steak and Ale restaurant, they fired 15 shots. Uh, they shot uh, at a couple of bank robberies or armored truck robberies. They shot and killed uh, the first the first kid they, they took, they stole the car from the um, Emilio Braille. They mm -hmm. shot and killed him. And yeah. then they shot and, and left for dead the, uh, the the owner of the Black Monte Carlo. So they had, they had uh, like four or five separate shooting incidents. Okay, in other words, their propensity to, to use deadly force was pretty obvious. Sure. 
Okay, I mean, they, they had demonstrated that they would shoot, you know, in a second, in a heartbeat, you know, at least three or four or five times before. So, and everybody uh, was concerned, and then Gordon McNeil, the supervisor, was concerned. So he ordered, he uh, mandated that the squad take a morning off and uh, through some of the SWAT agents who, uh, who were real good friends with the uh, Metro Dade County uh, Police Academy down over by Doral, but that sure. used to be by the Doral. I, I don't know where it is now. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. But um, they said, hey, see if we can borrow some, some space down there so we can do car stop training. Okay. So it's, it's funny that you asked that because we did do about a month ahead, we did do like a half a day of car stop training. You know, we, you know, the typical law enforcement training, you, know, you stop behind a car, two cars, you know, the, the typical standard uh, scenario that we teach. Okay. Uh -huh. But see, here's the kicker. And you know it as well as I know it. Those are called compliant car yes. stops. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to help you out and cooperate with you, they will, they will let you set up your, your, your little designer <laughs> car stop, you know, sure. uh, two cars this way, come out with your hands up, you know, put the keys. Right. The whole the show. The right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, those, those are compliant. Okay. But it's, how do you teach a non-compliant? Right. You need an EWOC course, you know, and some old cars There you go. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, to, to train that, you know, mm -hmm. to train for that. But, um, so we did, we did do it though. I mean, we had, we had the weapons out there, you know, long weapons. Mm -hmm. okay. How many people, you know, had weapons, long weapons with them, you know, the, mm -hmm. the SWAT guys and some of the, uh, some of the regular agents had, had, uh, checked out shotguns. So, you know, we got a feel for how, how to deploy a shotgun out of a car, you know, okay. If you've got a long weapon, you can't be doing cupping obviously because you've got right. the long weapon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that type of stuff, you know, we worked out a lot of little scenarios like that. So, we did do uh, some car stop training about 30 days before the shootout, you know, so we okay. were planning ahead, you know, we mm -hmm. were trying to, Perfect. trying to, uh, you know, mitigate as many uh, possible outcomes or circumstances as we could. Sure. On, with your group, with your squad that was out there that day, were there any SWAT guys in that group? Yes, there were. Uh, I thought, well, maybe, maybe uh, I designate them in my PowerPoint presentations, but out of the 14 agents that were there, mm -hmm. five were SWAT guys. Okay. We had five SWAT team members, and I'll name them for you. It was uh, Ben Grogan and okay. Jerry Dove, All right. uh, Ron Reisner, mm -hmm. uh, Bobby Ross, mm -hmm. and uh, God, I forget, Nelson, uh, Agent Nelson, God, Terry Nelson. Okay. Those, those guys were all SWAT guys. Every one of those guys, uh, Bob Ross had an M16. Uh, Terry Nelson had an MP5. Mm -hmm. um, ben and Jerry had a shotgun, and uh, uh, Ron Reiser had a shotgun. Okay. But they all had uh, high capacity uh, nine millimeter pistols, you know, the high capacity magazines. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, they had the, the extra, uh, extra firepower. Now, unfortunately, Bobby Ross with the M16 never, never got to, never got to the shooting in time. Okay. Okay. He had it with him. You know, he, he sure. had it there. Mm -hmm. he, he deployed with it. But I mean, could could I have used that like in the first 30 seconds of the shootout? You bet. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> not, yeah. Not in the last 30 seconds. You know? Sure. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're saying, and and this was at uh, what time, right? During the, the day. The call went out at about 9:25. Okay. Okay. I know. Attention, all units, and then. You know, by nine thirty-five, it was it was done. So, in that period of time, you've got guys that are doing these stakeouts in different areas, heavy traffic, trying to get to the scene to where you guys are, and that's probably where some of that heavier firepower was delayed. Am I exactly. am I right exactly. in saying that? It, absolutely right. You know, it, it, and I, I, I try to explain it in my book. It's kind of like fate. I mean, it's, it's time sure. and chance. Yeah. Time and chance. The guys at the northernmost location, uh, John Hanlon, myself, and, and Steve Warner, we had we had a Steve had a shotgun. I had a shotgun. But if you if you remember in the book, Steve went into the bank to to, to coordinate with the bank manager. Yes. And as soon as he went ten seven, they said, "Hey, I, I'm I'm stepping out of the car." As soon as he turned the car off, he, he notified us, "I'm stepping out of the car." 
He turned the car off, and like two seconds later, Ben Grogan makes his announcement. So he was out of the of the of the picture completely. Gotcha. Through no fault of his. Mm-hmm. Now the other agents who were who were farther south, okay, the the one with the MP5 and the M16, they were farther south and in heavy traffic. By the time they got there, it was it was it was done. It was yeah. over. You know, yeah. So. Mm. During the incident, the, the shooting, Platt was shot 12 times? Yes, a combination of shotgun uh, hits, 9mm, uh, 38, and maybe a, uh, some, some uh, pellets to his feet. To his feet. Uh, shotgun pellets to his oh, feet. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Maddox was shot six times, four to the neck and the head. Right. Actually, five. Five? Five to, to, the, to the neck and head. Okay. okay. One was, was to the right wrist. Okay. So, you know what? Even though he was shot fewer times than mm-hmm. Platt, he took some, some significant damage up to the brain housing group, you know? Sure. Up in his yeah. Head, yeah. In the neck area. Yeah. You know? So, whereas Platt him. got shot in the arms and the legs and the chest and mm-hmm. the hands, you know, and, and stuff like that. So... Um, and uh, and at the end of the uh, at the end of all this, you you were you made your way up uh, to the side of the vehicle, and uh, pretty much ended the scene. Correct. Correct. Why? And and it, with these two guys taking rounds the way they did, and fighting from the position that they were in. What kept the, what kept them going? That is, as they say, the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Okay, and that question right there is what sparked all the interest in, in this case. I mean, aside from from a normal interest, I mean, th- that question has sparked. I don't know how many books by other people, mm-hmm. psychologists and sure. doctors and, and mm-hmm. other police officers and stuff. And it boils down, John, to, to something that we really can't define, okay? And that boils down to the will to survive. That, and, and, and that's that's what I was going to start trying to peek at, um, yeah. you know, the, the, that combative mindset that we exactly. that we talk about uh, the will exactly. to keep going. Uh, exactly. Right. They were MPs, right? Military MPs. Uh, yeah, they were in an MP school, but the, for the hundred and first airborne. Okay. Uh, you know, Rangers. You know, I mean. Uh, Rangers. Rangers. Okay. Or Ura Rangers, or whatever, whatever their motto is. Sure. Okay. So, do you think, and do these doctors and everybody that's trying to study this down the road, is is there a thought that maybe? that where they came from, from their military background, that they had that combative mindset embedded and that kept them going for that period of time a little bit longer? Well, you, you know what, John? I don't think anybody can definitively say that, but I think logically speaking or intuitively speaking, it makes sense. I mean, mm-hmm. if, you, if, you, if you meet or, or interact with a, a guy who's been in the military, mm-hmm. okay, uh, who served in the military for for more than you know six it was a six month weekend warrior you sure know, mm-hmm. more than those you know somebody who did two years three years four years in the military okay you know that they have a, a slightly different mentality or, or attitude especially if they were in, in combat arms mm-hmm. okay but i mean when i was in the marine corps i mean we were always taught hey listen you never give up you keep fighting you keep fighting never give up you sure know? And, yeah. and and the the idea was uh you overcome an obstacle through fire, mm-hmm. you lay down fire and maneuver. Okay? Right. Mm-hmm. In the military, one side fires, the other side maneuvers. Then they fire, you maneuver, you know, and, and that type of stuff, mm-hmm. uh, that type of t- tactics, or fire and maneuver, okay? And it's it's an interesting area that we get to. I, I know we're talking about survival, okay? But uh, I think the military instills that. It's like, hey, you can do more than you think you can, okay? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, the human body can, can endure more than you think it can. Right. Okay. Yeah. You hate to find out how much more. Sure. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I, I don't want to go yeah. there, you know. But, but you know, once you're at the precipice, as they say, once you're at the line, mm-hmm. you know, you, you might you may have to step off past that line and find out how much more you can take, you know. Sure. But uh, 
keeping that in the back of our mind, okay, we go back to another philosophy. And I, I've just discussed, I have discussed it with people before. And you're a former law enforcement officer, as mm -hmm. am I. And do you have prior military service? I do. I do. I was okay. in combat arms in, in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Think about this, okay? Fire and maneuver. Huh? Fire and maneuver. Okay, what is the, what is the mantra for, for cops? If you take fire, if you get into a, a, a situation, what is the mantra? What, 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 what are we taught to do? Usually seek cover. Seek cover, return fire, return fire. if possible, mm -hmm. and call for backup. Right. Okay. Therein is where we have a budding of some huge heads, mm -hmm. some huge philosophies. Take cover. Call for backup. Mm -hmm. Fire and maneuver. Fire and maneuver. Fire and maneuver. Yes. You're still hunkered down behind yeah. cover. Fire They're... and maneuver. Fire and maneuver. That's exactly what they did. Gotcha. Whereas we were hunkered down, you know, behind cover. Mm -hmm. Platt fired and maneuvered. He laid down suppression fire on, on, on ben, ben Grogan, Jerry Doves, and John Hanna's position. Mm -hmm. Laid down suppression fire. Uh, wherever he could, he uh, he uh, eliminated the fire mm -hmm. because he ended up wounding all three agents mm -hmm. before they were before they were shot and, and or killed a second time. Mm -hmm. And then he maneuvered towards the car. He went to the back of uh, Ben Groga's car, shot John Hanlon two or three more times, came around the back of the car, and he, he shot and killed uh, uh, Ben Groga and Jerry Dove. Fire maneuver. Okay, whereas we are taught to take cover, assess the situation, return fire, and or and call for backup, mm -hmm. okay? I had enough time from my position, you know, when I when I was shot on the sidewalk to maneuver. I mean, I, I, I could hear the shooting from my 12 o'clock to my 1 o'clock to my 2 o'clock, 3 and, 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 and 3 o'clock position, okay? So I'm thinking, hey, I can't, I can't see through these cars. I can't see underneath the car. So I need to maneuver. I need to go around this, this car best I can to see what the hell's going on on the other side of this car. So mm -hmm. I maneuvered, but not as much as they did. Because okay. I mean, I, I was, <laughs> I was pretty much, you know, uh, shot down, you know, I mean, okay. mm -hmm. I, 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 I took a pretty devastating hit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't, luckily it wasn't to my center mass, you know, but it was, it, it ripped my arm off just about. Mm -hmm. So I maneuvered. And then when I got to a point where I, I saw what was going on, and that's when I'd laid down suppression fire to, to, to try to keep them from escaping. Mm -hmm. And then I'm thinking, well, you know what, though? It's a possibility that they're still alive. And I looked north and south, and nobody was coming in. N none of the good guys were coming in to help. So I figured, you know, correctly so, uh, the supporting officers don't know who the bad guys are, don't know who the good guys are, and they, they still think it's a hot zone. They still, they, they still think it's an active shooting, you know. So I said, hey, the only way that, that we're going to get help is if I show them that it's safe to stand up. And that was one of the motivating factors, among, among other things, mm -hmm. that made me stand up. Again, I stood up, and I maneuvered, and I'm firing. I'm, in, I'm maneuvering, and, and basically I'm closing the distance sure. between me and the target. Okay, so... Yeah. so there was a little bit of that fire and maneuver on the law enforcement side, but by and large, it was all on their side. It was all military tactics, fire and maneuver, fire and maneuver all the way around. And that, and plus it had the, the heavier weapon, you okay. know, they employed sure. the heavier weapon. So sure. I make a point of telling people, you know, that's something they don't realize, you know, you get law enforcement, a law enforcement mm -hmm. philosophy mm -hmm. and a military philosophy. And yeah. why is that important? Well, how many young men <laughs> have we trained over the last 20 years Mm -hmm. in, 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 in Iraq and Afghanistan, you sure. Know, uh -huh. There's a lot of guys out there that are, that are that they've seen some 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 shit. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of guys that are combat veterans. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some of them are good guys. Some of them are, are not. Right. You know, so you need to be aware of the fact that hey, you know, we're law enforcement. We're trained to do certain things, but you know, those military guys, you know, they have a different uh, different training. Uh, Sure, different uh, training, scenario, different, different mindset. Different, and, different mindset, correct, yeah. yeah. But the idea, you know, the same place true for cops, you know. Uh, you never give up. Right. You need to have the, a strong will to survive. You know, you and I cannot give anybody, John, you and I cannot give anybody the will to survive. 
Right. You know, we can talk about it. Yeah. We can encourage it. Mm-hmm. You know, we can teach it, but we cannot give it to you. That has to come from you. Okay? It's got to come. Need to be, you need to be desperate enough or comfortable enough or trained enough to know, hey, I can get out of this. I can do this. Right. Okay. But it's up to you. I yeah. Mean, I, kind yeah. of like the old saying, you can think, you can lead a horse to water, but right. yeah. you can't make them drink. 100%. Them, so. 100%. Yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah, you're right. You're right on the money there. Uh, body armor. Were you guys, did you guys have body armor on at the time? Was it available? It was... Oh, it was, everybody had it. Mm-hmm. Okay. But you know, Florida, it's hot. It's, it's yeah. too hot. You know, it's steamy. It makes you sweat. You know, and um, one. There were two guys wearing body armor, Gordon McNeil and Ron Reiser. My body armor was in the back seat. Okay. I had a plan that morning. I was going to, you know, go, you know, go to our surveillance location, look around, you know, assess, you know, where the entrances, the exits, the parking lot, you know, back and forth, you know. So we were sipping coffee, you know, I'm thinking, okay, as soon as I finish my coffee, I'm going to, you know, once we find a, a, a spot to, to look to surveil the area, I'm going to step outside, get the body armor out of the back of my car, put it on, and then put my raid jacket on on top of that. I never got to that point. Hmm. Okay, I, I did. I, I, that was my initial plan. But, you know, as I'm still having, I still had a cup of coffee in my hand when Ben Grogan says, attention all units. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, you know, yeah. it's like it's, it's too late. You know. So, gotcha. Yeah, hmm. But it was available to everybody. Okay. Did the, uh, after all was said and done, uh, Washington, they reviewed this, right? And what what came out of this? Well, it took, as you can well imagine, it took mm-hmm. several weeks and months mm-hmm. for everything to kind of develop, to kind of shake out, I guess, because initially, uh, the initial reports were totally wrong you know they they were they were trying to blame Gordon McNeil for being negligent or whatever you know and they were trying to blame other agents for for doing you know not being prepared or whatever you know so but when it was all said and done when you know it's kind of like (laughs) you wait for evidence before you you convict somebody Mm -hmm. so but once 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 the evidence came in and and the the crime scene was was reviewed and, and everything and tactics and so on and so forth Again, the big kicker is compliant and non-compliant car stops, okay? As it turned non-compliant, you know, all bets are off. You, you don't know where that car was going to stop mm-hmm. you know, or how it was going to stop, you know. And, and if you look at the at a, uh, at a photograph of the crime scene, you, you know how it stopped. It stopped with them being crashed into an, another civilian car, a civilian car between an FBI car and a tree, okay? So, I mean, that was never planned, okay? That's right. just the way it turned out. You know? Sure. But uh, <clears throat> the first thing that came out was uh, fr- from the autopsy was ballistics. Okay, Jerry Dove, and, and as I describe in the book, you know, Jerry Dove shot Platt, you know, in, in the first thirty seconds of the of the gunfight, shot him. It, it, the best I can describe it is it's a profile, not not a, not a face on, right. but a side side mm-hmm. profile, <coughs> center mass, center mass hit okay. with a nine millimeter round. Okay, and it went through his bicep, up his bicep, through his right chest wall, did not hit any ribs. It went between the ribs, penetrated his right lung, and stopped. I have an X-ray. You can see the the round. It stopped. I sort of got it. It's like a half an inch short of his heart. Okay, half an inch. Okay. <clears throat> so that shot is called a non-survivable shot, non-survivable hit. And I, I've asked a couple of doctors, you know, if that is in, in, in fact the case. And they said, yep. You know, they said, hey, even if he had stopped right then and got into a hospital, it, there was a, a very high likelihood that he was going to die. Okay, because of, of the he had a brachial artery mm-hmm. rip tear, and then yeah. and then the lung was just shredded. Okay, and then it stopped right at the center mass. You know, there's a lot of arteries and stuff in there. Sure, <clears throat> not big ones, but big enough. Sure. <laughs> you know? uh. 
uh, at autopsy, he had a, he had a, about a quarter blood in his lung, mm -hmm. and he had about a, another quarter blood in his uh, 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 plural, plural cavity, right. you know, the, mm -hmm. the cavity, uh, the, the lining between his lung and his chest wall. Yeah. Okay. So that's two quarts of blood in his body. <laughs> okay. Uh, they're almost two quarts full, you know, and then God knows how much how much other blood he spilled around this, the the crime scene, you know. Mm -hmm. So they said he had uh, he had bled out about forty to forty five percent of his blood, okay, and and that's a I'm told that's a, a pretty serious, uh, you know, uh, that's a life and death uh, mm -hmm. uh, scenario, you know. So so that was one of the first things that came out is the ballistics. Why didn't this round penetrate deeper? Okay, so that led to all the huge research for the next two or three years about the nine millimeter, the 45, the 10 millimeter that led to the development of the 40 caliber, uh, Smith and Wesson 40 caliber right. round. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is what caused that research to happen. That's what, that's what changed the trajectory of, of law enforcement ballistics to go this way as opposed to continuing down the same road. Gotcha. And again, you know, I don't have anything against nine millimeters. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it took me a while to come to that conclusion because I was told that Jerry Doe fired a, a 115 grain silver tip hollow point, mm -hmm. okay, from a nine millimeter pistol, okay? The weapon did what it was supposed to do. The agent performed fantastically. Mm -hmm. I mean, center mass hit on a profile target, okay? And I was told that the weapon did what it was supposed to do. And the round, based on the parameters that the round, that was, round. was advertised, it, it, mm -hmm. the round did exactly what it was supposed to do. Yeah. Okay. But in this particular case, it, it, it ended up being about an inch short. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's what led to, led, led to the, okay, minimum penetration, 12 inches, maximum penetration, 18 inches in, in law enforcement ammo. So that's where that came from. From, from that hit, okay, because okay? Mm -hmm. it penetrated about 11 and a half, 11 inches, 11 and a half inches, and another another half an inch or an inch would have killed him sure. right away. Sure, sure. So, how long, let me ask you, how long did he keep performing after that shot? Well, that, that's what I'm telling you. He got shot in that manner in the first 30 seconds of the shot. First 30 Probably seconds. At the, at, at, at the 30 second mark. Yeah. Okay, at the 30 second mark. And this thing goes on for approximately five minutes. Okay. Unbelievable. So, you know, if like I said, it's, that half an inch or an inch would have ended it. Yeah, right yeah. there. Yeah. You know, it's just totally, I mean, whole different outcome, you know. Mm. Now, after the ballistics, then we get, went into the uh, weapons. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've got the bullets. Now you're looking at the weapons, okay. He had a 30-round magazine rifle. Okay, I've used assault rifle, and I've, I've had people say, that's not an assault rifle, that's a... That's a mini 14. You know, it's not really an assault rifle. I'm mm -hmm. thinking, dude, it's got a 30 round magazine. For yeah. me, it's an assault rifle. Sure. You know? yeah. But I've had some some firearms of aficionados tell me, don't yeah. even dare call that an assault <laughs> rifle. You know? uh -huh. An assault rifle is a 7.62. You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm thinking, no shit, Sherlock. I mean, yeah. that, that assault rifle would have killed everybody. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so. It, it, we went to, to, to weapons, to studying of weapons, okay? And if you think about it, I mean, it, it makes, I mean, you don't, it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. You have a six-shot revolver, okay? Mm -hmm. You can only carry six shots versus uh, Ben Grogan, Jerry Dove, and, and all the other SWAT guys. They had 15-round magazines, mm -hmm. okay, in their nine millimeters. Okay, I would have to reload twice, you know, to, to fire 15, uh, 15 rounds. Sure in my revolver, okay? Mm -hmm. And then Platt had a 30-round magazine capacity rifle, okay? I'd have to shoot five times, reload five times before I could equal 30 rounds, you know? So mm -hmm. it just be <clears throat> it became, you know, like I said, a no-brainer. It's like, okay, we need to get higher capacity uh, handguns sure. in, into the hands of agents. And uh, <clears throat> we need to get the, uh, better or more long weapons into the hands of, of officers, agents, mm -hmm. okay? So what the FBI did is, you know, that started, it was hand in hand. You, you had the ballistics testing on one hand, and then once the ballistics was determined, then you could start the selection of a weapon, okay? So that, that kind of went, you know, you can't put the cart before the horse. Right. So, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me. Mm -hmm. 
so the weapon selection, you know, was, was after the ballistics testing, okay? And one thing that was determined right away is that we needed to get long, long or long weapons into the ages of, uh, of uh, into the hands of agents. So the FBI went out and spent a gazillion dollars. <coughs> Excuse me. They they bought one MP5 for every two agents. Okay. Okay. Be, be, before in, in, in uh, the MP5 uh, uh, availability or uh, inventory was limited to SWAT teams. SWAT, yeah. Now, the, the fully automatic MP5 still went to SWAT, but uh, the Bureau went to H&K, and, and they uh, they ordered, uh, uh, like, I don't know, 2,000 semi-automatic MP5s. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so they distributed them to all, you know, across the, across the country. And they ordered short-barrel shotguns, 12-gauge shotguns, okay. also distributed out to to the, uh, the the field, so it, what ended up being like by 1990, I think there was one MP5 or one shotgun for every two agents, for every, you know a pair of agents in the car. Mm -hmm. They they had they could have a choice, a shotgun or an MP5, one of the two. Okay. So uh, they did that right away. On top of that, the bureau loosened the regulations on personally owned rifles. Okay, they said, hey. The current issued rifle for the FBI and probably all law enforcement, federal law enforcement, was the M16. They said, "Hey, if you if you purchase your own civilian copy, and in, in other words, an AR-15, uh, mm -hmm. and because uh, it ha it's it's all a matter of parts right. and, and maintenance, mm -hmm. you know, if sure. you have a if you have an exotic r rifle, you know, and and everybody else is using Colt right. rifles." Okay, you've got your exotic weapon over here. It's going to take special orders, you know. Cost more money. Cost, mm -hmm. You know, everything. So sure. they said, hey, everything has to fit into the inventory. Yeah. <clears throat> so they said, hey, any agent who wants to purchase his own AR-15 can do so as long as you qualify, as long as it's inspected by the, by the, uh, uh, by the FBI uh, gun, gunsmiths mm -hmm. at Quantico, and you qualify with it at least minimum once a year. So... Okay. You okay. Know, a lot of guys went out and got, the, their, got their own, own AR-15s. Gotcha. So okay. That was that was uh, the change. And then the third thing, which is the important part, why in the hell did he keep fighting? Yeah. Okay. That yeah. is the that was the sixty four thousand dollar question. Right. What made him keep fighting? Okay, and it just goes down to will to survive yeah. mindset. Yeah. You know, you you know, military trained. You know, there are some hard people out there that aren't military trained. Right. Okay. Sure. They have they have a different character, different makeup. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, hey, um, I don't I, honestly, John, I don't know how to describe it. You know, yeah. it's just a different. Uh, but you, you look, can do. And can you're can right, do exactly. And like you said yeah. earlier, you you can't teach that. You can't teach that to people. No. You know, you you have it in you. You don't. Yeah. On on the revolver side. Speed loaders? Yeah, everybody had them. Yeah, okay. Everybody had them. So that, was, that would at least yeah. help you uh, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I was carrying two speed loaders myself, you know, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And any extra ammunition besides the six in the revolver, the two speed loaders? So you got 18. I had five extra, five, had five extra shotgun rounds in my, in my uh, I, I was wearing a windbreaker. Okay. I wasn't wearing, I, I, I misspoke earlier. I was not wearing a blue FBI ray jacket. I was okay. wearing a windbreaker. Okay. Okay. With It, it was a different color. You know, uh -huh. you know, you don't want to sit on a surveillance unit wearing a blue windbreaker that has FBI, FBI. <laughs> in six inch letters yeah. on your chest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I put on the, uh, my, my own personal windbreaker and I had, I had five extra rounds in, in, in my pocket, my left pocket, you know, so. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Um, 36 years? For what, sir? For, since the incident? Wow. 86. Yeah. 36 yeah. 36 years. Hi. It, it only seems like yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. How are you doing with it? I'm doing pretty good. You know, it took me a while. You know, obviously, you know, uh, you know, you go through PTSD. I mean, right. you know, I don't mm -hmm. want to sit here and go, oh, what was me? Poor, mm -hmm. poor you know, Mrs. Morellis's little kid, you know, poor, mm -hmm. poor Eddie, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, 
I didn't suffer as badly as other people did, you know, um, but I did suffer PTSD, you know, and I, I suffered, uh, I tell people, I said, hey, I went seven years and I can count it, you know, seven years. Um, initially, I mean, after any, any uh, violent confrontation, whether it's a car crash or whatever incidents you have, you know, it, it can cause PTSD. But the thing that I kept punishing myself with for seven years was I kept asking myself this question. Could I have done something better or could I have done something different mm -hmm. to save Ben and Jerry? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I asked myself that question. Mm -hmm. And I asked myself that question. And I remember, I don't remember the exact date, John, but I remember the, the anniversary. It was the seven year anniversary of the shooting, okay? Because, you know, you get melancholy when you come up to the anniversary sure. day. You know, it's like, wow, you know, it's been, it's been seven years, it's been mm -hmm. ten years, whatever. Um, <clears throat> and on the seventh year, you know, I'm, I'm sitting alone someplace and I'm thinking, you know, could I have done something better? Could I have done something different? And I had punished myself for seven years asking that question. And I asked it more than once. I mean, I, sure. so, you know, mm -hmm. like for the first two or three or four years, I asked myself that every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I mean, I wasn't losing sleep or, you know, taking drugs or, or, or doing stupid stuff, but I mean, it, it did, it did take a, a mental energy, mm -hmm. you know? So, and finally on the seventh year, I remember I kept asking that question and you know, who, you know, who had to answer that question? Me. Yeah. Yeah. I had to answer my own question. Sure. Okay. Cause I kept asking an open-ended question. It's like, could I have done something better? You know, mm -hmm. and finally on the seven year anniversary, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I think I can accept the fact that, and I think Ben and Jerry would accept the fact and have accepted the fact that I did everything humanly possible mm -hmm. to try to help them and save them. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think, and I just, and I'm talking to myself mentally or, or, or in, you know, really sounding out there, I forget how it was, but I, I remember the process, you know, and I, I answered my own question and I finally came to the conclusion. I said, yeah, you know what? I think Ben and Jerry would agree with me that I did do everything mm -hmm. humanly possible mm -hmm. to help them. And I think they, they're, they're satisfied with that. And the only person who isn't satisfied with that is me. Sure. <laughs> you know? sure. So I said, hey, as long as I accept that fact, you know, I think everything will be okay. And you know what happened? When I said, you know what? I did do everything humanly possible. I, mm -hmm. I did the best I could. You know what happened? It was like... Relief. Poof, it's like a bubble burst. Absolutely. Or the, someone pulled the, the, you know, the wool over my... I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the veil off my face. And it's like, wow. I mean, it, it just... I mean, I can still, I can still uh, see it in, in my mind's eye, you know? Mm -hmm. And after that, I've never, never had any issues. You know? Good, thank God. I, I had to answer my own question. Sure. Nobody else can answer that question. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. So, um, and, and I don't want to minimize, you know, uh, PTSD. I mean, it's real. You know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People sure it is. Help. Mm -hmm. You know, people commit suicide with this stuff. Sure. So, and that's too bad because I mean, there is help out there. I mean, you can talk to people. I know, I know people with PTSD don't want to talk to novices. You know what I'm saying? They yeah. Want, they don't want to talk to. to vampires you know that they, they kind of live vicariously from your experiences they, they, sure. you don't need people like that you need somebody who really understands you yeah so. absolutely absolutely <clears throat> ed i appreciate i couldn't i can't tell you how much uh you coming on with me man it's uh again it's a, a real honor to speak to you well, um, john it's my pleasure really i mean I, I i like to share this stuff because uh you know, I, people ask me, why did you write the book? I said, well, I wrote the book because, uh, number one, it's a damn good story. Yeah. <laughs> number two, it's a true story. Mm -hmm. But the biggest reason I wrote it is in, initially there was so much misinformation mm -hmm. out there. So much misinformation. Yeah. I was thinking, God almighty, this is terrible. You know, and I w I've been asked about the, the, the made for TV movie. I'm thinking, right. oh, mm -hmm. God, you know, that's terrible. I said, you know what? The only thing that movie got right was there was a shooting, and it was in Miami. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the rest of it, was, they they 
they never they never consulted the, the participants. They never consulted the participants. Really? About about the incident. They all they did was they took our they took our, our uh, signed sworn statements. And wow. they used them to, to make the movie. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me, you know. So the movie, I mean the, the actual shooting itself is like maybe, I don't know, ten percent, twenty percent correct. I'm surprised DC allowed that. Well, the thing is, you know, yeah. I don't know. It was, I, I don't know how it happened, you know, but yeah. it happened, you know. So, yeah. but anyway, so amazing. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. How can uh, anybody that's listening to this purchase your book? Where can they? Well, how can they, they reach can go out? Go to my website. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for for asking, John. Uh, they can go to my website, Ed Ed Morellis dot com, mm -hmm. and they can order a. a a specialized autographed copy there, mm -hmm. or just a regular copy there, mm -hmm. or they can go to Amazon and and look look for it there, you know. But the Amazon will not allow. I mean, if you want, if anybody's looking for a, an autographed copy mm -hmm. or a specialized, you know, anything special, I, I can't do it through Amazon because Amazon just says, "Boom, hey, you've got a book order, fill it," you know. <laughs> gotcha. Whereas yeah. at my website, you know, I can get messages, you know, from, from the website saying, "Hey." Ed, can you sign the book to uh, to John? You know, mm -hmm. your best friend. Mm -hmm. Thanks for saving my life in Vietnam or something. Mm -hmm. like that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, okay. That type of stuff, you know. So, but either or, my website or Amazon. Okay, perfect. Uh, if they wanted to reach out to you uh, in any other ways, are you on social media, anything like that? Well, I'm on uh, I'm on Facebook. Facebook. And okay. uh, my website again, edmarillis.com. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a way to send me messages through that. Okay. Uh, there's a, right. I think the last page or at the bottom of the page, it'll say message, message to author or something like that. You okay. can just click and say, click your email address and then your message and boom, it'll get to you. you know, so. Perfect. Ed, thank you. I appreciate your time. No, and, John, uh, I, I appreciate your invitation. I really do. And uh, I, hope your, I hope your listeners uh, get something out of it. You know? uh, I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. And I'm on this end, of the, I'm pushing the book to uh, – <laughs> to my law enforcement people and uh you know i want them to read it because it is an education and it's uh it's a true story yeah so thank you sir okay, i appreciate thank it you so much. all right have a great thank day you. take care thank you bye-bye bye-bye